Chapter 5 A sudden shutting off of the waves left Carter in a chilling and awesome silence, full of the spirit of desolation. On every hand pressed the illimitable vastness of the void, yet the seeker knew that the being was still there. After a moment, he thought of words whose mental substance he flung into the abyss. I accept, I will not retreat. The waves surged forth again, and Carter knew that the being had heard. And now there poured from that limitless mind a flood of knowledge and explanation which opened new vistas to the seeker and prepared him for such a grasp of the cosmos as he had never hoped to possess. He was told how childish and limited is the notion of a tridimensional world and what an infinity of directions there are besides the known directions of up-down, forward-backward, right-left. He was shown the smallness and tinsel emptiness of the little gods of earth, with their petty human interests and connections, their hatreds, rages, loves, and vanities, their craving for praise and sacrifice, and their demands for faith contrary to reason and nature. While most of the impressions translated themselves to Carter as words, there were others to which other senses gave interpretation. Perhaps with eyes, and perhaps with imagination, he perceived that he was in a region of dimensions beyond those conceivable to the eye and brain of man. He saw now, in the brooding shadows of that which had been first a vortex of power, and then an illimitable void, a sweep of creation that dizzied his senses. From some inconceivable vantage point, he looked upon prodigious forms whose multiple extensions transcended any conception of being, size, and boundaries which his mind had hitherto been able to hold, despite a lifetime of cryptical study. He began to understand dimly why there could exist at the same time the little boy Randolph Carter in the Arkham Farmhouse in 1883, the misty form on the vaguely hexagonal pillar beyond the first gate, the fragment now facing the presence in the limitless abyss, and all the other Carters his fancy or perception envisaged. Then the waves increased in strength, and sought to improve his understanding, reconciling him to the multiform entity of which his present fragment was an infinitesimal part. They told him that every figure of space is but the result of the intersection by a plane of some corresponding figure of one more dimension, as a square is cut from a cube, or a circle from a sphere. The cube and sphere of three dimensions are thus cut from corresponding forms of four dimensions that men know only through guesses and dreams, and these in turn are cut from forms of five dimensions, and so on up to the dizzy and reachless heights of archetypical infinity. The worlds of men and of the gods of men is merely an infinitesimal phase of an infinitesimal thing, the three-dimensional phase of that small wholeness reached by the first gate, where Umar At-Tawil dictates dreams to the ancient ones. Though men hail it as reality, and brand thoughts of its many-dimensioned original as unreality, it is in truth the very opposite. That which we call substance and reality is shadow and illusion, and that which we call shadow and illusion is substance and reality. Time, the waves went on, is motionless, and without beginning or end. That it has motion, and is the cause of change, is an illusion. Indeed, it is itself really an illusion. For except to the narrow sight of beings in limited dimensions, there are no such things as past, present, and future. Men think of time only because of what they call change, yet that too is an illusion. All that was, and is, and is to be, exists simultaneously. These revelations came with a godlike solemnity which left Carter unable to doubt. Even though they lay almost beyond his comprehension, he felt that they must be true in the light of that final cosmic reality 
which belies all local perspectives and narrow partial views. And he was familiar enough with profound speculations to be free from the bondage of local and partial conceptions. Had his whole quest not been based upon a faith in the unreality of the local and partial. After an impressive pause, the waves continued, saying that what the denizens of few dimensioned zones call change is merely a function of their consciousness, which views the external world from various cosmic angles, as the shapes produced by the cutting of a cone seem to vary with the angles of cutting, being circle, ellipse, parabola, or hyperbola according to that angle, yet without any change in the cone itself, so do the local aspects of an unchanged and endless reality seem to change with the cosmic angle of regarding. To this variety of angles of consciousness, the feeble beings of the inner worlds are slaves, since with rare exceptions they cannot learn to control them. Only a few students of forbidden things have gained inklings of this control, and have thereby conquered time and change. But the entities outside the gates command all angles, and view the myriad parts of the cosmos in terms of fragmentary, change-involving perspective, or of the changeless totality beyond perspective, in accordance with their will. As the waves paused again, Carter began to comprehend vaguely and terrifiedly, the ultimate background of that riddle of lost individuality which had at first so horrified him. His intuition pieced together the fragments of revelation and brought him closer and closer to a grasp of the secret. He understood that much of the frightful revelation would have come upon him, splitting up his ego amidst myriads of earthly counterparts inside the first gate had not the magic of Umar at Tawil kept it from him in order that he might use the silver key with precision for the ultimate gate's opening. Anxious for clearer knowledge, he sent out waves of thought, asking more of the exact relationship between his various facets, the fragment now beyond the ultimate gate, the fragment still on the quasi-hexagonal pedestal beyond the first gate, the boy of 1883, the man of 1928, the various ancestral beings who had formed his heritage and the bulwark of his ego, and the nameless denizens of the other aeons and other worlds which that first hideous flash of ultimate perception had identified with him. Slowly the waves of the being surged out in reply, trying to make plain what was almost beyond the reach of an earthly mind. All descended lines of beings of the finite dimensions, continued the waves, and all stages of growth in each one of these beings are merely manifestations of one archetypal and eternal being in the space outside dimensions. Each local being, son, father, grandfather, and so on, and each stage of individual being, infant, child, boy, young man, old man, is merely one of the infinite phases of that same archetypal and eternal being, caused by a variation in the angle of the consciousness plane which cuts it. Randolph Carter at all ages, Randolph Carter and all his ancestors, both human and prehuman, terrestrial and preterrestrial, all these were only phases of one ultimate, eternal Carter, outside space and time, phantom projections differentiated only by the angle at which the plane of consciousness happened to cut the eternal archetype in each case. A slight change of angle could turn the student of today into the child of yesterday, could turn Randolph Carter into that wizard, Edmund Carter, who had fled from Salem to the hills behind Arkham in 1692, or that Pickman Carter, who in the year 2169 would use strange means in repelling the Mongol hordes from Australia, could turn a human Carter into one of those earlier entities which had dwelt in primal Hyperborea and worshipped black plastic Sothagwa after flying down from Kithanil, the double planet that once revolved around Arcturus, could turn a terrestrial Carter to a remotely ancestral and doubtfully shaped dweller on Kithanil itself, 
or a still remoter creature of transgalactic Shonhai, or a four-dimensioned gaseous consciousness in an older space-time continuum, or a vegetable brain of the future on a dark radioactive comet of inconceivable orbit, and so on in the endless cosmic circle. The archetypes, throbbed the waves, are the people of the ultimate abyss, formless, ineffable, and guessed at only by rare dreamers on the low-dimensioned worlds. Chief among such was this informing being itself, which indeed was Carter's own archetype. The gluttless seal of Carter and all his forebears for forbidden cosmic secrets was a natural result of derivation from the supreme archetype. On every world, all great wizards, all great thinkers, all great artists are facets of it. Almost stunned with awe and with a kind of terrifying delight, Randolph Carter's consciousness did homage to that transcendent entity from which it was derived. As the waves paused again, he pondered in the mighty silence, thinking of strange tributes, stranger questions, and still stranger requests. Curious concepts flowed conflictingly through a brain dazed with unaccustomed vistas and unforeseen disclosures. It occurred to him that, if those disclosures were literally true, he might bodily visit all those infinitely distant ages and parts of the universe which he had hitherto known only in dreams. Could he but command the magic to change the angle of his consciousness plane? And did not the silver key supply that magic? Had it not first changed him from a man in 1928 to a boy in 1883, and then to something quite outside time? Oddly, despite his present apparent absence of body, he knew that the key was still with him. While the silence still lasted, Randolph Carter radiated forth the thoughts and questions which assailed him. He knew that in this ultimate abyss he was equidistant from every facet of his archetype, human or non-human, earthly or extra-earthly, galactic or transgalactic, and his curiosity regarding the other phases of his being, especially those phases which were farthest from an earthly 1928 in time and space, or which had most persistently haunted his dreams throughout his life, was at fever heat. He felt that his archetypal entity could, at will, send him bodily to any of these phases of bygone and distant life by changing his consciousness plane, and despite the marvels he had undergone, he burned for the further marvel of walking in the flesh through those grotesque and incredible scenes which visions of the night had fragmentarily brought him. Without definite intention, he was asking the presence for access to a dim, fantastic world whose five multicolored suns, alien constellations, dizzy black crags, clawed, taper-snouted denizens, bizarre metal towers, unexplained tunnels, and cryptical floating cylinders had intruded again and again upon his slumbers. That world, he felt vaguely, was in all the conceivable cosmos, the one most freely in touch with others, and he longed to explore the vistas whose beginnings he had glimpsed, and to embark through space to those still remoter worlds with which the clawed, snouted denizens trafficked. There was no time for fear, as at all crises of his strange life, sheer cosmic curiosity triumphed over everything else. When the waves resumed their awesome pulsing, Carter knew that his terrible request was granted. The being was telling him of the nighted gulfs through which he would have to pass, of the unknown quintuple star in an unsuspected galaxy around which the alien world revolved, and of the burrowing inner horrors against which the clawed, snouted race of that world perpetually fought. It told him, too, of how the angle of his personal consciousness plane and the angle of his consciousness plane regarding the space-time elements of the sought-for world would have to be tilted simultaneously in order to restore to that world the Carter facet which had dwelt there. 
The presence warned him to be sure of his symbols if he wished ever to return from the remote and alien world he had chosen, and he radiated back an impatient affirmation, confident that the silver key which he felt was with him, and which he knew had tilted both world and personal planes in throwing him back to 1883, contained those symbols which were meant. And now the being, grasping his impatience, signified its readiness to accomplish the monstrous precipitation. The waves abruptly ceased, and there supervened a momentary stillness tense with nameless and dreadful expectancy. Then, without warning, came a whirring and drumming that swelled to a terrific thundering. Once again, Carter felt himself the focal point of an intense concentration of energy which smote and hammered and seared unbearably in the now familiar alien rhythm of outer space, and which he could not classify as either the blasting heat of a blazing star or the all-petrifying cold of the ultimate abyss. Bands and rays of color, utterly foreign to any spectrum of our universe, played and wove and interlaced before him, and he was conscious of a frightful velocity of motion. He caught one fleeting glimpse of a figure sitting alone upon a cloudy throne more hexagonal than otherwise. Chapter 6 As the Hindu paused in his story, he saw that De Marini and Phillips were watching him absorbedly. Aspinwall pretended to ignore the narrative and kept his eyes ostentatiously on the papers before him. The alien-rhythmed ticking of the coffin-shaped clock took on a new and portentous meaning, while the fumes from the choked, neglected tripods wove themselves into fantastic and inexplicable shapes, and formed disturbing combinations with the grotesque figures of the draft-swayed tapestries. The old negro who attended them was gone. Perhaps some growing tension had frightened him out of the house. An almost apologetic hesitancy hampered the speaker as he resumed his oddly labored yet idiomatic voice. "'You have found these things of the abyss,' Hard to believe, he said, but you will find the tangible and material things ahead still harder. This is the way of our minds. Marvels are doubly incredible when brought into three dimensions from the vague regions of possible dream. I shall not try to tell you much. That would be another and very different story. I will tell you only what you absolutely have to know. Carter after that final vortex of alien and polychromatic rhythm, had found himself in what, for a moment, he thought was his old, insistent dream. He was, as many a night before, walking amidst throngs of clawed, snouted beings through the streets of a labyrinth of inexplicably fashioned metal under a blaze of diverse solar color, and as he looked down, he saw that his body was like those of the others, rugose, partly squamous, and curiously articulated in a fashion mainly insect-like, yet not without a caricaturish resemblance to the human outline. The silver key was still in his grasp, though held by a noxious-looking claw. In another moment the dream sense vanished, and he felt rather as one just awaked from a dream. The ultimate abyss the being, an entity of absurd outlandish race called Randolph Carter, on a world of the future not yet born. Some of these things were parts of the persistent, recurrent dreams of the wizard Zakauba on the planet Yadith. They were too persistent. They interfered with his duties in weaving spells to keep the frightful bowls in their burrows and became mixed up with his recollections of the myriad real worlds he had visited in his light-beam envelope. And now they had become quasi-real as never before. This heavy, material silver key in his right upper claw, the exact image of the one he had dreamt about, meant no good. He must rest and reflect, and consult the tablets of Ning for advice on what to do. Climbing a metal wall in a lane off the main concourse, 
he entered his apartment and approached the rack of tablets. Seven day fractions later, Sakauba squatted on his prism in awe and half despair, for the truth had opened up a new and conflicting set of memories. Nevermore could he know the peace of being one entity. For all time and space, he was two. Sakauba the wizard of Yadith, disgusted with the thought of the repellent earth mammal Carter that he was to be and has been, and Randolph Carter of Boston on the earth, shivering with fright at the clawed snouted thing which he had once been and had become again. The time units spent on Yadith, croaked the Swami, whose labored voice was beginning to show signs of fatigue, made a tale in themselves which could not be related in brief compass. There were trips to Shonhi and Mithora and Kath and other worlds in the twenty-eight galaxies accessible to the light-beam envelopes of the creatures of Yadith, and trips back and forth through aeons of time with the aid of the silver key and various other symbols known to Yadith's wizards. There were hideous struggles with the bleached, vicious bowls in their primal tunnels that honeycombed the planet. There were odd sessions in libraries amongst the massed lore of ten thousand worlds, living and dead. There were tense conferences with other minds of Yadith, including that of the arch-ancient Buo. Sakauba told no one of what had befallen his personality, but when the Randolph Carter facet was uppermost, he would study furiously every possible means of returning to the earth and to human form, and would desperately practice human speech with the buzzing alien throat organs so ill-adapted to it. The Carter facet had soon learned with horror that the silver key was unable to affect his return to human form. It was, as he deduced too late from things he remembered, things he dreamed, and things he inferred from the lore of Yadith, a product of Hyperborea on Earth, with power over the personal consciousness angles of human beings alone. It could, however, change the planetary angle and send the user at will through time in an unchanged body. There had been an added spell which gave it limitless powers it otherwise lacked, but this too was a human discovery, peculiar to a spatially unreachable region and not to be duplicated by the wizards of Yadith. It had been written on the undecipherable parchment in the hideously carven box with the silver key, and Carter bitterly lamented that he had left it behind. The now inaccessible being of the abyss had warned him to be sure of his symbols, and he had doubtless thought he lacked nothing. As time wore on, he strove harder and harder to utilize the monstrous lore of Yadith in finding a way back to the abyss and the omnipotent entity. With his new knowledge, he could have done much toward reading the cryptic parchment, but that power, under present conditions, was merely ironic. There were times, however, when the Zikalba facet was uppermost, and when he strove to erase the conflicting Carter memories which troubled him. Thus long spaces of time wore on, ages longer than the brain of man could grasp, since the beings of Yadith die only after prolonged cycles. After many hundred revolutions, the Carter facet seemed to gain on the Zikalba facet, and would spend vast periods calculating the distance of Yadith in space and time from the human earth that was to be. The figures were staggering, aeons of light years beyond counting, but the immemorial lore of Yadith fitted Carter to grasp such things. He cultivated the power of dreaming himself momentarily earthward, and learned many things about our planet that he had never known before but he could not dream the needed formula on the missing parchment. Then at last he conceived a wild plan of escape from Yadith, which began when he found a drug that would keep his Zikalba facet always dormant, yet without dissolution of the knowledge and memories of Zikalba. He thought that his calculations would let him perform a voyage with a light-wave envelope such as no being of Yadith had ever performed a bodily voyage through nameless aeons and across incredible galactic reaches 
to the solar system and the Earth itself. Once on Earth, though in the body of a clawed-snouted thing, he might be able somehow to find, and finish deciphering, the strangely hieroglyphed parchment he had left in the car at Arkham, and with its aid, and the keys, resume his normal terrestrial semblance. He was not blind to the perils of the attempt. He knew that when he had brought the planet's angle to the right aeon, a thing impossible to do while hurtling through space, Yadith would be a dead world dominated by triumphant bowls, and that his escape in the light-wave envelope would be a matter of grave doubt. Likewise, he was aware of how he must achieve suspended animation in the manner of an adept to endure the aeon-long flight through fathomless abysses. He knew, too, that, assuming his voyage succeeded, he must immunize himself to the bacterial and other earthly conditions hostile to a body from Yadith. Furthermore, he must provide a way of feigning human shape on earth until he might recover and decipher the parchment and resume that shape in truth. Otherwise, he would probably be discovered and destroyed by the people in horror as a thing that should not be. And there must be some gold, luckily obtainable on Yadith, to tide him over that period of quest. Slowly, Carter's plans went forward. He provided a light-wave envelope of abnormal toughness, able to stand both the prodigious time transition and the unexampled flight through space. He tested all his calculations and sent forth his earthward dreams again and again bringing them as close as possible to 1928. He practiced suspended animation with marvelous success. He discovered just the bacterial agent he needed and worked out the varying gravity stress to which he must become used. He artfully fashioned a waxen mask and loose costume, enabling him to pass among men as a human being of a sort, and devised a doubly potent spell with which to hold back the bowls at the moment of his starting from the black dead Yadith of an inconceivable future. He took care, too, to assemble a large supply of the drugs, unobtainable on earth, which would keep his Akalba facet in abeyance till he might shed the Yadith body, nor did he neglect a small store of gold for earthly use. The starting day was a time of doubt and apprehension, Carter climbed up to his envelope platform on the pretext of sailing for the triple star Nython and crawled into the sheath of shining metal. He had just room to perform the ritual of the silver key, and as he did so, he slowly started the levitation of his envelope. There was an appalling seething and darkening of the day and a hideous racking of pain. The cosmos seemed to reel irresponsibly and the other constellations danced in a black sky. All at once, Carter felt a new equilibrium. The cold of interstellar gulfs gnawed at the outside of his envelope, and he could see that he floated free in space, the metal building from which he had started having decayed ages before. Below him, the ground was festering with gigantic bowls, and even as he looked, one reared up several hundred feet and leveled a bleached, vicious end at him, but his spells were effective, and in another moment he was falling away from Yadith unharmed.